Welcome to Jewish Life, a program presented in cooperation with the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York. I'm your host, Stuart Aim. Every week we present programs of particular interest to the Jewish community. Today my guest is Rabbi Mark Schneier. He's the founding senior rabbi of the Hamptons Synagogue in West Hampton Beach, Long Island, and president of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, which he established some 31 years ago. I understand he just came back from a uh, from Azerbaijan, is that right? Yes, uh, about 10 days ago. Uh, I came back How that? Um, after spending a week there, uh, meeting with uh, the president of the country, uh, President Taliyev, and I congratulated him on the um, his great Jewish community. He happens to be the largest Jewish community in the Muslim world. There 57 Muslim nations, Azerbaijan has the largest Jewish community. And Azerbaijan is quite unique um, in terms of its support for Israel. It's probably Israel's greatest supporter in the Muslim world. And I reminded the uh, president that as uh, the host of this large Jewish community, it's only a source of pride, but it's also great responsibility. But I must tell you that President Taliyev um, has paid great honor and shows great respect to his community. And that's why it's a prosperous Jewish community in a Shiite majority Muslim country. He borders Iran, which is, uh, how, how, what are his relations like with Iran? Uh, not good. Um, not as good as his relations with Israel. Um, as the president and I discussed, you know, that he lives in a bad neighborhood. Uh, south of him is uh, Iran, and just west of him is Russia. So uh, despite that, Azerbaijan continues to be that beacon, that paragon of interreligious and intercultural activity, dialogue, coexistence. It really is wonderful. I remember uh, before COVID-19, I was visiting with one of the uh, rulers in the Gulf who was considered normalizing ties with Israel. And he said, Rabbi, so what would you envision for my kingdom in terms of its relationship with Israel? I said, just study the model of Azerbaijan, if you follow that example, then you will have a very, very uh, genuine, authentic relationship uh, with the state of Israel. I understand you're talking about an alliance of rabbis in Islamic countries, something like mm -hmm. 20 rabbis are in 14 countries. Can you talk about that? Correct. Um, I have been working with them. The uh, president of the alliance is a rabbi, uh, Citric who is a rabbi in Turkey, in Istanbul. And recently they formed this alliance of rabbis that are serving in Islamic countries. Uh, it could be uh, Turkey, it could be Iran, uh, it could be Indonesia, it could be Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, it could be uh, UAE. And they're looking to now uh, cooperating, working together uh, because they are a group of rabbis that represent over 100,000 Jews now living in Islamic uh, Muslim countries. And that is a number that continues to grow um, so that uh, this organization, this association will continue uh, to gain importance and uh, attraction. That's a rabbinic organization, right? Correct. Right. Now, there's also uh, the Association of Gulf 
Jewish communities that was recently created to serve the Jewish populations of uh, the six countries, Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. Can you talk about that? Well, of those six countries, only two have Jewish communities, if not Jews. And that's uh, UAE and Bahrain. Bahrain has probably about 30 Jews. Uh, UAE may be a thousand Jews that are expats. You might find one or two Jews here and there in uh, Oman and uh, Qatar. 19 in so, Oman. What? 19 in Oman. They used to uh, be 40. Where, used to be 40. Where, where, where do you get that figure from? Uh, this is in a story that just came out this, uh, this past week. I what, that there are 19 Jews in Oman? 19 Jews in Oman. There, there were, used to be 40, and now there are only 19. Okay, so the thing is, you should know the former ambassador That's of the United said. States to Oman, Mark Sievers, um, and his wife are two of those uh, supposed 19. Anyway, I, I think, you know, it, it's a wonderful uh, uh, initiative. Uh, particularly as more and more Jews not move to the Gulf, but visit the Gulf. You know, I launched back in December a major initiative of uh, North American Jewish tourism, that's U.S., Canada, and Mexico to the Gulf, um, involving all six Gulf states, which will require um, a proper infrastructure in terms of uh, synagogues, in terms of kosher restaurants um, and the like. So uh, again, I think that throughout the Islamic world, we are seeing uh, the exponential growth of Jewish life. And it's a, a wonderful phenomenon that we're now experiencing. In fact, after and, and, also, and also Stuart, not to minimize the contribution that Chabad, is making uh, in this regard. You know, there is a rabbi in the Dubai, uh, Rabbi Levi Duchman, who is the Chabad rabbi, uh, who has been servicing um, the um, different, uh, the Jewish community of Bahrain, um, in Qatar, uh, you have the American base that may on occasion have uh, several Jews. So, and I know Rabbi Duchman is also uh, visited Oman, so you know. Let's not minimize the incredible contribution that Chabad is making. If you look at this alliance of Islamic rabbis, the overwhelming majority of the rabbis happen to be members of Chabad. Interesting, interesting. Um, now, in 2020, the Abraham Accords were signed um, to the, <clears throat> between Israel, United Arab Emirates, and uh, and a number of other countries are now signed. No, up. and 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 all, and, and, Bahrain. and Bahrain, right? And, right. And, and but but um, in the in the months after that signing, which was in late, I guess, uh, uh, or middle of nineteen twenty of uh, eight uh, twenty twenty, um, one hundred and thirty thousand Jews visited the UAE. I mean, it was like a uh, uh, just unplugged the cork and everybody came. What, what what do you make about that? Well, I wrote a uh, very important op-ed on this for UAE's leading uh, English paper, the Khalish Times. And I'll respectfully correct you, it wasn't 30,000. 130,000. It was, what? 130,000. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said 30. In December no. alone, December alone, it was uh, 70,000 when I was there. So the question you might ask, you know, how does one explain this phenomenon? And it's not only the fact that so many Jews, but it's such a natural, natural progression. I mean, what I experienced in Dubai, that it was a love fest between the Emiratis and between the Israelis. And my conclusion is that there are no two other faith communities that have more in common that are closer together than our family, more than uh, Judaism and Islam. Uh, I often speak of our common faith, 
and our common fate. We are both the children of Abraham, or as my Muslim colleagues would say, uh, Abraham. And yeah, you know, there's so many commonalities. You know, we pray three times a day, Muslims pray five times a day. We face Jerusalem, they face Mecca. Uh, we have dietary laws of kosher, kashru, they have halal. Remember that uh, kosher is halal, but halal is not kosher. Mm -hmm. um, they have imams, we have rabbis. So I don't see this as a new beginning as much as a reconnection. It's a reunification of these two religions, of these two faith communities. I mean, there's something very familial, as in the word family, when it comes to uh, Muslims and Jews. So, you know, I, I think there has been no process in terms of the reconciliation because there's no need for a process. It, it's not a reconciliation. It's a reunification of what has been the bond, the familial bond between Muslims and Jews, you know, for close to 4,000 years. Yeah, now you were uh, in the forefront, you were a pioneer of the Muslim-Jewish relations some, what, 20 years ago? Correct. Correct. I was a pioneer, and, and particularly in the Gulf. But 20 years ago, um, you know, we, we had reached a benchmark in the foundation for ethnic understanding. We were established 31 years ago to help rebuild and restore the historic alliance between Blacks and Jews in the United States. And when you examine the civil rights struggle of the 50s and 60s, there was no segment of American society that provided as much and as consistent support to Dr. King and to the Black community as did the Jewish community. I mean, just look at the numbers of the college students that came down on the Freedom Rides in 63 and 64 from the North, uh, more than 70% 70, uh, 70 were Jews when the American Jewish population was below 1% of this country. Um, so the Jewish community played an outsized role in terms of civil rights from blacks. And uh, unfortunately, after Dr. King's assassination, that relationship spiraled downward, perhaps its lowest point being the Crown Heights riots of 1991. But I would say by 2004, 2005, at the foundation, you know, we realized a mission accomplished. So we had a dilemma. We could do what uh, very few Jewish organizations do, and that's say, okay, mission accomplished, let's close up shop. Or we pivot on to something else. And I believed at the time that one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century for the Jewish people was an inter-religious challenge and that is to find the path to narrow the gap, the chasm, the divide between 1.6 billion Muslims and 16 million Jews. So I set off on this journey, um, very often to the chagrin of some of my uh, co religionists in the Jewish community. Well, that was no different back when I started the Black Jewish Relations Program when I was, you know, billed as the white Al Sharpton until I became a bloody hero in the Jewish community. And I followed the same trajectory here. Um, and uh, in 2008, uh, the ambassador, the then ambassador of Saudi Arabia uh, to Washington, to the United States, Anil al Jaber, who now is the Foreign Minister, Minister of State of the, of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, was closely monitoring my work. King Abdullah at the time had a, a launch a major initiative uh, trying to uh, create a new or present a new face of Islam in terms of reaching out to the West. Uh, I was invited to participate in King Abdullah's 
uh, first interfaith conference in Madrid, Spain, 2008. Uh, you know how uh, shy I am by nature. So of course uh, I was quite a <laughs> personality and you can read all about it at the conference. And it was the king of Saudi Arabia who under his patronage, who brought me to the Gulf. And he brought me to the Gulf and to help build Muslim Jewish relations, knowing that I also had a keen interest in seeing relations established between the Gulf and Israel one day. Uh, I remember when I first entered the Gulf, I would hear from different Gulf leaders, from Muslim faith leaders, Rabbi, we have no issue with Jews, it's Israelis and Zionists. Um, and literally for 12, 13 years, I just hammered away at the fact that Israel for the Jewish people is not a political issue. It's a religious issue. It's been at the very core of Judaism for more than 3,500 years. And you're asking me as a Jew to bifurcate, to break out Israel from Judaism. It's like my ask. Asking uh, you, I would say this in response, you know, to break out uh, um, Sharia, you know, halal from Islam. And if you want to have an authentic dialogue with the Jewish people, then you need to recognize, you need to acknowledge where Israel is in Judaism, so the very core of Judaism. And look at the tremendous, tremendous progress we made. Um, it was a remarkable journey for me. It was like, you know, my own version of Khan Gadya, because the king of Saudi Arabia introduced me to the king of Bahrain, who introduced me to the mayor of Qatar, who introduced me, you know, to the crown prince of UAE, and so on and so forth. Um, but yes, I was, you know, very much a pioneer. I think that there were two platforms that brought this about. That you have the political platform, and then you have the interface. Uh, platform, um, interfaith diplomacy. And it's a very powerful channel and vehicle, particularly in a region that is so steep in religion. There's no way that the King of Bahrain or the Crown Prince of UAE, or for that matter, many of the very bold initiatives of the late King of Saudi Arabia could have taken place without the support, without the backing of the religious leadership of those countries. So I think that the interfaith platform and interfaith diplomacy played as important a role in realizing normalization of ties with Israel uh, as did the political platform. There are no Jews now in Saudi Arabia, no Jews in Kuwait, um, what, 35 in Bahrain. It's, do you expect that to change? I could see more Jews moving to um, Bahrain. I could see more Jews moving to UAE. But I definitely see multitudes of Jews once this pandemic passes. I'm not talking about the Israelis. I'm talking about American Jews visiting the Gulf on their way to Israel. Uh, remember, I led the first synagogue mission ever to the Gulf, the Hampton Synagogue, uh, Gulf mission to Bahrain, uh, at the invitation of the King of Bahrain back in 2018. And uh, just before COVID-19, that first week of March, we were to be the first synagogue mission again ever to Oman. And then we had a council at the last minute because of, uh, you know, because of COVID-19. So I think that you're going to see more and more individual synagogue groups, Jewish organizations, you know, everyone's looking for, um, you know, for something fresh, for something new. So the last 10 years, if you were quote unquote chic or thinking out of the box, you wanted a little Muslim experience. <laughs> oh, so you went to Morocco, you went to Jordan, you went to Egypt. But my God, you know, you have the opportunity of now going to the Gulf, which is simply an extraordinary, extraordinary place to go. 
Um, and you're going to have now all these kosher restaurants and kosher well, food and hotels. That. Some of the hotels have it. And already, yes, uh, you expect more to come in. Yes. I mean, I, I know for a fact, I think there are three or four kosher for Passover programs in Dubai. Um, in this, this spring, we're talking about five weeks from now. Um, in fact, I've been invited you know, to appear at uh, several of them. Uh, truth of the matter is, my first love for Passover is not the Hamptons. It's being in, uh, in Tel Aviv. And we'll see if that's still possible. Um, and then in Bahrain, the Ritz-Carlton is in the process of opening up its new kosher kitchen. Uh, which other, I forgot uh, the other hotel in uh, Bahrain. Uh, again, it's it's just a phenomenon. You know, it's it's becoming chic uh, <laughs> to uh, have this kosher uh, food available, and um, it's all about bringing Jewish tourists, who are not only tourists but are potential investors to the region as well. Also, a bed din is going to be established. Listen, yeah, I mean they're going to have a bed din. Yeah, uh, they're gonna all the all the a group, a group, you know the word <laughs> exactly. The, Listen, they'll have their bet in, Chabad will have their bet in, and uh, we'll, we'll and, and let the uh, mightier one come out on top. You know, that Azerbaijan for the last few years, the famous region, the, the mountain region of the mountain Jews, uh, that dates back to 1500 years. It's also the uh, summer resort for many of the oligarchs in Russia. They've had two kosher for Passover programs in Azerbaijan. One had 800 people, really? one had 500 people, people, even people in my own congregation have gone to these programs. So listen, I think it's wonderful. You're looking at 14, uh, you know, you're looking at Jewish communities in 14 countries. I don't see a kosher for Passover program in Iran these days, but I could see one in uh, Kazakhstan. I could definitely see one in Qatar. You know, the um, Qataris have asked me, even though I'm not in the kosher food business, to advise them. They want to open up a kosher restaurant uh, in Doha for the World Cup, November 2022. Yes, And I'm working, you know, closely with both the Emir and the um, and the um, Secretary General of the World Cup, uh, Hassan al Thawari, who's made very, very clear that not only all Jews are welcome, all Israelis are welcome. Um, but I even believe that we may see Qatar, uh, possibly Oman, Saudi Arabia, normalizing ties with Israel. Uh, I think we have to pay attention to what they're saying. Uh, they're all saying that they're not going to cross that line uh, coming closer to Israel until the plight of the Palestinians are addressed. The irony is that our new president, God bless him, Joe Biden, is more in line with the Saudi Qatari position than Donald Trump ever was, because Biden also recognizes the need to address the plight of the Palestinian people. And I do believe that President Joe Biden is the one that will bring the Saudis and the Qataris to the table uh, to normalize relations with Israel. You do. Would you, yes. want to, would you want to get involved in those talks? Would I want to get involved in those talks? I'm always involved in those talks. I just can't talk about it. I see. So do you foresee, uh, seriously, do you foresee that there'll be a Palestinian, is, Israeli, um, peace agreement? Uh, they're, not, they're not necessarily demanding, look, they would like to see a resolution to the conflict. Right. But one thing they will not tolerate is the fact that there's no conversation taking place now. I participated uh, a year and a half ago in the um, historic conference in Bahrain uh, that was called Peace to Prosperity. That was convened by uh, our former president, Jared Kushner, and the like. Uh, it was held in Manama, Bahrain. I was in a very unique position. I was not 
a member of the American delegation. I was a member of the Bahraini delegation. But you had the representatives of Saudi Arabia, of Qatar, uh, UAE, and of course Bahrain there. And they were talking about the importance of bringing economic empowerment, advancement opportunities to the Palestinian people to the tune of $50 billion, creating 1 million jobs. I think that the Gulf states recognize they have some real skin in the game. They're going to have to play a very important role. They can play a financial role here. But what they are demanding is that there needs to be some movement. It can't just be in a, a stalemate. You know, the way it is now for them to move forward. And I think with President Joe Biden, you will see some movement uh, in this regard. And, and by the way, and think about before the Abraham Accords, I mean, the irony of this, the only Gulf state that was working publicly with Israel was Qatar. Qatar was sending all the money to Gaza, not only with the blessing of the Israelis, but at the request of the Israelis. So look at the very important role Qatar has and continues to play in trying to keep some semblance of, of normalcy, of, of, of quiet, you know, at least so that the Palestinians in Gaza have you know, some very basic elementary you know, uh, needs to live, to function. But again, this is a partnership. It's a partnership that is between Israel and Qatar. Qatar would not be able to go into Gaza if the Israelis are not green lighted. And the Israelis are, you know, they're pleading with Qatar to please, you know, continue uh, supporting the, you know, the uh, Palestinians. Yeah, I think they've even, they've even increased the funding. Um, but do, do you see the need for a change in leadership in, in the Palestinian Authority? that we have to wait for these new elections that are now scheduled for this summer uh, before things might change? Yes, I, I happen to believe that. I just spoke about that on, um, I forgot which program in Saudi Arabia. Listen, it, it, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I think one of the challenges Israel faces is that they don't really have a partner um, to negotiate. Um, you know, I, I know Mahmoud Abbas, I met him several times um, at his office in Ramallah. Uh, I don't know if the man really has the capacity to make this deal. Um, it could be a generational thing. It could be just the fact he's not that kind of visionary, that kind of leader. And there's no question, Stuart, that that would be a very, very necessary component in terms of bringing about a resolution. But again, my sense, what I hear from leaders in the Gulf, it's not, even though they speak about a resolution, they want to at least see some movement, some movement, um, not this complete, um, you know, distancing or, or, or this uh, total lack of communication. Uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Now. That, that they are not going to accept uh, you know, before uh, reaching out to uh, Israel. The Abraham Accords really riled them, I think, the Palestinians. They didn't like it. They don't like it. Um, they think that they're being bypassed, and so they've been very upset about it. Do you, do you see them come to terms with these accords? They don't have a choice. You know, and, and they behave uh, like a bunch of children at the uh, conference in Bahrain a year and a half ago. They, they didn't show up. You know, everyone's there uh, knocking their heads against the wall, trying to come up with um, an economic plan. It's been a very fast half hour. Thank you so much, Rabbi Mark Schneier. He is the founding senior rabbi of the Hampton Synagogue in West Hampton Beach, Long Island, and president of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Stuart. Sure, it's always a pleasure. Thanks very much. We'll see you next week.